Marhaban wa ahlan bakum fi baranamaj dakhil Washington. Ana mutifakum Robert Satloff. Bada'at al sana al jadida wa demokratiya hawl al alam tata'arad lil hajamat. Fi al Brazil el alaf min al munasirin lil rais al sabiq Bolsonaro yaqtalun muadhim munatik al asaba bisabab rafad raisihim kabul hazimatihi fi al intikhabat. في حركة تذكرنا بتمرد ستة يناير في واشنطن. في أوكرانيا أطلقت روسيا هجمات صاروخية مدمرة ضد الأقدام المدنية وردت على هزائمها في ساحة المعركة بارتكاب جرائم حرب فظيعة. وفي إيران حيث تواجه أكيادة تمردا على السعيد الأمة بدأ النظام بإدام منتقديه لوقف النضاء المطالب بالهورية ماذا يعني كل هذا بالنسبة للديمقراطية؟ ماذا يعني كل هذا بالنسبة للحرب والصراع في عام 2023 ماذا يعني كل هذا بالنسبة لأمريكا لمناقشة هذه التطورات المهمة والتابعتها على السياسة الخارجية الأمريكية يسرني أن أستدف لجنة من الخبراء دينيس روس ووان زراتي Welcome back to Dachl Washington These are tough days for democracy in parts of the world We're going to take a look around the globe and I'm delighted to be joined to do this with Juan Zarati and Dennis Ross Thank you gentlemen for joining me this morning Let's, let's you, start in a place we don't normally talk much about on this show, Brazil. What happened there on January 8th was horrifying, especially because it was so eerily reminiscent of what happened here almost exactly two years earlier. Juan, what happened in Brasilia? Well, you had uh, a, a scenario that very much seemed to mimic what happened in the United States and certainly politically um, Somewhat different, but uh, the forces of uh, of autocratic uh, rule, leftist a uh, leftist uh, victory with Lula taking over again, but with disputes around the election uh, driven by Bolsonaro as he exited uh, his role in, in leading Brazil. Um, all of that led to conspiracy theories, uh, disputes on the transition of power. Um, and really a, a, a revolt of the right that has supported Bolsonaro throughout his regime. Um, and what you have in Brazil is not just a mimic of what happened in the U.S. in terms of disinformation and dispute of the election and that handover of power, but also the, the movement back leftward, which we've seen in other parts of Latin America and in places like Chile and Colombia and Argentina, uh, where you've moved from a, a right of center or right wing uh, party and politics swinging back to the left. And I think what you saw in, in Brazil was much of those gyrations playing out in the context of disinformation and a disputed election. And it was, uh, it was not good to see, uh, but certainly it seems like the Brazilians have put things back in order uh, and the transition to, uh, to uh, Lula da Silva's new regime is now underway. Uh, Dennis, is uh, Brazil's the largest democracy in Latin America? Is there a threat to this democracy? Do we, do we fear reverberations throughout the continent? I don't know that we're going to see a rever reverberation throughout the continent. I do think that what we're seeing is part of a larger trend as it relates to existing democracies where there's a populist trend. Uh, the populists are highly nationalistic by definition, kind of reject the other. Uh, I would say they're not drawn to legal niceties. They don't seem to want to respect the existing legal codes and norms. Uh, that's what we saw in Brazil. Uh, in many ways, we saw it here. I think what, what Juan said, is, which is kind of reassuring, is notwithstanding a challenge that, again, was eerily reminiscent of what we saw also because Bolsonaro was based in the case well in advance of the election, that there would be fraud. So he was preparing the ground for precisely this. You know, the idea of the big lie is you repeat the same thing over and over again, and pretty soon everybody believes it, or at least your constituency believes it. 
Uh, and when you think an election has been taken away from you, it justifies any behavior. And they, there is a populist movement that is not unique to Brazil, not unique to the United States. We're seeing it uh, in almost all democracies. Uh, I just think it's one of the things we have to guard against. And uh, Bolsonaro was in Florida throughout this episode. Um, was there an American connection to what happened in Brasilia? Uh, did, did Americans play any role in, in trying to subvert uh, democracy in, uh, in that uh, big country, Juan? I don't think there was anything directly. There may have been the perception of that with Bolsonaro, certainly in, in South Florida. Uh, he was also getting medical attention. Um, but I think there, there has been a perception that there is a link between the right-wing populism that, that Dennis described in Brazil, in the U.S., and other parts of Western democracies. And so there, there, there is uh, this, this common thread of both ideology and political movement and methodology, uh, the disinformation, the, the repeating of fraud in elections, uh, the disputing of uh, not only transfers of power, but legitimacy of institutions. Uh, these, are, these are hallmarks of some of the elements or the more extreme elements of right-wing and even left-wing populism. Um, but I don't think there was a, a direct link. Uh, and the fact that Bolsonaro left before the transition of power wasn't there for the handoff of power it was certainly indicative of the schism within Brazil and with, within Brazilian politics uh, and was a signal that something was going to happen and there was going to be a, a challenge and, and problems. And that's precisely what we saw in Brasilia. Well, we, we've seen some of these um, uh, 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 challenges to democracy emerge in countries um, uh, around the world. I mean, I'm not talking just about Iran and Russia, um, uh, the big uh, exporters of, uh, of disinformation and, and, uh, and, uh, and problems like that. But take, for example, in a, in a, a tried and true American ally like, uh, like Italy, which now has a, 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 a sort of ideological descendant of, of Mussolini as, as the prime minister. How did that happen, uh, Dennis? Look, I think the, the growth of populism generally reflects what has been a, a budding sense that there are parts of the population that have been disadvantaged by what they see as globalization, by what they see as big money elites, by the way capital moves. Uh, and there is this sense somehow that these elites uh, are denying the quote publics what are in a sense their just rights. Uh, they're looking for an explanation for why there are threats to their identity. They're looking for an explanation for why their futures, especially economically, seem more uncertain. And along come these populist movements that have a simple explanation for everything that, that is threatening to them. And again, I would say, bear in mind what populists play upon is typically a threat to identity. When, and identity is so fundamental. It's almost existential. And when, that's, when there's a threat of that sort, it uh, basically can justify anything in response. You, you want a simple answer, but you feel so fundamentally threatened that you're prepared to turn to anyone who seems to have an answer. And the populists always have a very simple answer because they always have a very simple uh, enemy or you know, they have a very simple conspiratorial explanation for why the reality is what it is. And when you're desperate, you tend to be, and you're fearful, you tend to be attracted to those simple explanations. Um, uh, Juan, go ahead. Yeah, Rob, I just want to underscore what Dennis said. I, I, I think the crisis of identity and the challenge to identity has really driven uh, the strength and, and uh, popularity of, the, of these movements, whether it's in Italy, in the U.S., in Brazil, um, and there are common features, right? What are the challenges to identity? It's, um, it's foreigners, immigration, it's uh, institutions that are not looking for uh, for the best interests of the common man. It's, uh, to Dennis's point, the, the role of elites and elite institutions to undermine the very nature of people's identity and society. And so it's this crisis of identity, this challenge to identity, I, I couldn't agree more with Dennis, that's really fueling this. And to a certain extent, Rob, we've talked about this in the terrorism context, because so much of the violent extremist uh, ideologies that have driven terrorism over the last 20 to 30 years uh, are, are driven by this sense of crisis of identity, of reinforcing a particular uh, 
narrative about identity, be it religiously based or or politically based. Um, and it's this challenge of what identity means in 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 uh, in, in different national contexts that has given rise to different forms of populism. Uh, and that's why you see what, what you've seen in Italy and in Hungary and in Brazil and in, uh, in, in even in the United States. Uh, and that's why there's a, a, a focus on the throughput of what are the common elements that you see throughout. And frankly, are there connections between these groups that are fueling the most violent forms of these populist movements? Well, so you just opened up a number of questions. So let me let me just pursue the last one for a moment. Are there connections? Are there connections between um, uh, uh, the the supporters or the ideologues behind uh, Orban in Hungary and Maloney in Italy and and Erdogan in Turkey and Bolsonaro in in Brazil and perhaps even Americans? Well, I, I think there are, and I think um, as both national security officials look at this as well as uh, political analysts, they certainly do see connections. They see connections ideologically. The, the messaging of these groups um, tends to resonate and is echoed, uh, certainly with social media across national borders. Uh, you see connectivity of funding, uh, certainly the, the focus on what Russia and Putin has funded uh, is, in Europe in particular with respect to these populist movements has come under a lot of scrutiny, certainly in the wake of, uh, of Putin's aggression uh, in Ukraine. Um, and even methodologically, where there's a, a, a focus on whether or not there is actual material support between certain groups, uh, certainly in the, in the white uh, supremacist and extremist groups in the United States and their connectivity uh, in places like Australia or in Europe, those are things that are being looked at uh, uh, very closely. And so the answer is yes, there are connections. How deep, how widespread is certainly a subject of debate, but that is certainly something that officials in the United States are looking at. Dennis, you wanted to say something here? I did want to say something. One very briefly touched on it, but I think we have, let's go back almost a decade and let's look what Putin has been doing in Europe. Uh, Le Pen's party got a, got a loan uh, from the Russians, uh, everything that the that Putin was trying to do was to create was to play upon the fissures within society and then play upon these fears. You know, you have a a constant flow of disinformation on social media that's designed to create an impression. Look what the elites are doing to you. Uh, there's this was not accidental. You know, this has probably succeeded at Putin from Putin's standpoint far beyond what his expectations were. Of course, now he has his own set of problems because of his own miscalculations. But still, the idea that there are these kind of transnational connections, uh, we've seen it grow over the course of the last decade, and Putin's hand was pretty active in it. All right, when we come back after the break, I want to at least inject a note of optimism into this uh, pretty pessimistic discussion to, to ask why, in some places, the center has been able to hold and defeat um, these populists. Um, uh, we'll get into that, and then we'll talk about um, some of the really bad actors, Russia, China, and Iran, in just a moment. So, gentlemen, there, there are some places where the center has pushed back and pushed back quite successfully. Um, uh, France, for example, the right never made it um, to, uh, to the Elysee Palace. In Germany, the right made a big push but has been pushed back to the margins. Why in some countries does the center hold so well and in other countries the center collapse and you have a uh, just this this deeply partisan fight between the hard left and the hard right. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. I think every every country has its national context, so it's hard to generalize, broadly speaking. But but that said, I think uh, in in the French context, the German context, even the American context, with the the last election, I would say you had a. A, a resettling of the political landscape. That is to say, 
These, these are movements that have existed prior to the last few years, but um, they, they've been given greater energy and focus in, in different ways. But the center is held in part because the center has been able to govern. And there's, there's a, I think, a fear or at least a, a concern in many societies as to what the extremes of both the far right and the far left, uh, what that actually means. In the United States context, for example, there was a there was the sort of the mantra that the crazies lost uh, in the election. There, that there was not an appetite to move toward the extremes, uh, and I think in in France and Germany, I think there was a bit of that. I think the sense of dislocation outside of the countries had a, a bit to do with that crisis outside of the country, and the unwillingness of the populace to actually inject into. Uh, new forms of governance and new forms of populism or extremism at a, at a time of dislocation uh, is potentially unsettling. So I think what you had was a, a reversion to the middle at a time of crisis uh, in, in these various countries. I would simply add, all the countries where we've seen them hold off these extremes is also, they all are also countries that have deeply rooted institutions. And the institutions, I think you can say the institutions held. Uh, if you're looking at countries where there's been a more recent transition, you probably have more of a reason to be concerned because the institutions are not nearly as deeply rooted. I also just add, just to build on Juan's point, there came a point where there was a perception that what these populist movements represented was a threat, not an answer, but a threat. And they became deeply unsettling because of that. So it doesn't. It isn't to say we're out of the woods. Any of these countries are out of the woods because you still need good governance. You still need to avoid fundamental economic crises. You still need to manage what are these perceived threats to uh, to identity because of immigration and the flow of refugees and the like. But there is fundamentally a sense where, where the institutions are strong and deeply embedded. There's been a kind of more fundamental socialization that accepts the boundaries within which uh, politics ought to operate. And what we've seen is these extremes are outside those boundaries. All right, so um, perhaps one of the best pieces of good news, if you'd like, is that the most powerful and vocal advocates for this assault on democracy aren't faring so well themselves these days. Uh, Russia, China, Iran. What's going on inside these countries in general? And does this give us a little, uh, a little room for, if not uh, hope, at least a little sang froid that uh, that they're in deep trouble themselves. Juan, Rob, there was a sense I think in in recent years, certainly during the COVID period or the height of it, that the autocratic states were an ascendancy, that their form of governance was preferable, um, and that their populations were more satisfied uh, than than in democracies. And I think what we've seen in the last year uh, to two years has really uh, shattered that perception. And I think what, what it reflects is a fragility of how these governments actually govern and whether or not they have the consent of the, of the populace. And I think you've seen that tension in China, certainly with the, uh, the change in their COVID policy, uh, the, the protests that emerged there. You've seen this in the protests in Iran with, led by the women's movement, uh, the, the anti-hijab movement, that has really given life, not just to women's rights in Iran, but to an anti-regime movement that has uh, really gained momentum both internally and externally. And, and with Russian miscalculations, as Dennis mentioned in, in Ukraine, a real sense of crisis, I think, of Putin's leadership, uh, as well as the future of, of Russia, um, given the, the fragility of what appears to be uh, autocratic overreach uh, across the board. And so what has, was, has been seen as a crisis of democracy is really a crisis of governance among the autocratic states led by their own people protesting what governance means in those, in those contexts. You know, I would just add, you have these autocratic regimes with individuals like Putin and President Xi who drew all the instrumentalities of power to themselves. Now that was very much based upon an image they created of infallibility. Brilliant analysis, taking the analysis into direct policy implications for the U.S. administration. Thank you so much, Dennis Ross, Juan Zarate.
for laying this all out for our viewers throughout the Middle East. Thank you for joining us on Dachel Washington. What happened in Brazil recently was scary. On January 8th, thousands of supporters of Jair Bolsonaro stormed Brazil's Congress, Supreme Court, and Presidential Palace, refusing to recognize that their candidate lost a free and fair vote for the country's presidency. Bolsonaro, who was in Florida at the time, did not specifically call on his faithful to attack the government, but he certainly cultivated an environment in which this was a legitimate response to election denial. Eventually, security forces quashed the insurrection and arrested large numbers. What was scary was that the events of January 8th in Brazil, the largest democracy in Latin America, were a virtual carbon copy of the events in Washington, the oldest democracy in the world, on January 6th, two years earlier. In other words, in addition to blue jeans, Facebook, and Teslas, we are successfully exporting our political dysfunction. Expanding our exports is terrific, but this is one American product that we would be wise not to ship overseas. Already, there are some disturbing links between the seedier side of our democracy and authoritarians abroad. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, the Putin-friendly leader who governs what he likes to call an illiberal Christian democracy, where press freedoms, judicial independence, and individual rights have been curtailed on his watch, is a darling of American conservatives who feted him last year at their annual political conference. Giorgio Maloney, the neo-fascist who now leads Italy's right-wing governing coalition, counts Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's Rasputin, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, the wacky conservative congresswoman from Georgia who believes California wildfires were started by Jewish space lasers, as among her most ardent supporters. And the list goes on. Of course, Americans have always had links to ideological compatriots abroad, liberals with liberals, conservatives with conservatives, etc. But for the most recent past, our conservatives were small L liberals, advocating for smaller government and more personal liberty. Today's radical conservatives are different. Like traditional big L liberals, they call for massive government intervention in society, just a certain type of intervention, an intervention designed to advance radical conservative views, views that, like Orban's, Maloney's, Marie Le Pen's in France, and Erdogan's in Turkey, run against the core ideals of American democracy. It is certainly not the responsibility of the United States to police how democracies throughout the world develop. Some will veer left, others will veer right, a few will slip into the extremes, hopefully with enough resilience to pull themselves out. But it brings our country no honor to help those countries move backward, as many of those leaders redefine progress. The events in Brazil were a harsh wake-up. We can either be the shining city on the hill, as Ronald Reagan liked to quote, or provide a terrible model to vulnerable countries, as was the case with the connection between our January 6th and their January 8th. Let's hope this is one export we don't ship anywhere else ever again. Wasalna ila khatam hadhil halkam in Barnamaj dakhil Washington in Kanla daykum asla o ta'liqat how about Barnamaj wa bil akhas bishan al taqdidat dudul demokratia ilati tawajihuha America wa khulafauha tawasulu mai rajaan abr twitter ala hashtag inside washington o rasuluni mubasharatan al rabit at rob satloff Ilalaka feels boil kadim hatadalaka hain shukran wa ilalaka.